to preach. He doesn't need me to do an altar. He's going to meet you at your seat. And I believe some of you, your lives are going to be forever changed. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, um, before we get into the text, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna introduce um, uh, something to you this morning. So I grew up in a town called Fuquay, Verena, North Carolina. I promise you, you don't want to say that too fast. Okay, um, that is where my parents had planted a church. My grandparents they lived in this really small place called L.A. Okay, um, uh, yeah, it's not what you think. It's Lower Alabama. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I promise. I grew up and my parents had made me believe the real. LA was lower Alabama. So you can imagine as I grew up and I got friends and they're talking about LA and I'm talking about LA, I quickly quickly learned we're not talking about the same place, right? Uh, I spent most of my summers in Alabama, either on the lake with a pop-up camper or in my grandpa's barbershop slash flea market slash whatever he wanted to call it. Um, The walls were covered in old posters of hairstyles that were popular before I was even born. Um, A TV that was always turned to the local news and stacks of old whitetail magazines. The fridge was full of yoo-hoos and the coffee pot was always full of cold Folgers. Conversations about Alabama versus Auburn, who was going to win the Iron Bowl that year? I would just watch my grandpa cut hair and listen to everyone that sat in the chair. My grandpa is seriously one of the best listeners ever. I don't know if it was because he was about to doze off because he had worked all day and I was boring him. You know what I mean? I had worked all day. I had drank three who's eaten every little Debbie cake in his little spot that he was trying to sell. And uh, I had sweeped the floor a couple times, you know, to earn that. But I believed um, it was because our conversations were that good. Uh, he just knew how to listen well and give wisdom where he saw fit and where the Holy Spirit nudged him. I grew up watching him take phone calls during the evenings with people that were trying to barter a deal for something in his uh, flea market, or they were calling him to ask for prayer. He would listen right then and pray. I also grew up watching my grandpa go cut hair for the disabled. And my grandma would go drop off groceries to those who couldn't afford them or who had a disability. I remember she would go sit and talk with this man who who had a disability and no one would listen to him but my grandma. I grew up wondering why they were so incredibly kind to anybody they met. If someone needed something from my grandparents, they would find a way. My grandpa would take me fishing for 30 minutes to an hour after work. That's genuinely why I would get up at 6 a.m. to be with him all day at the barbershop just for a shot to fish with him. And uh, as I got older, he began to use those moments to speak into my life. And I remember as I got older, I would ask him, why do you do things for people without wanting to get anything in return? Why do you feel, you know, so, so at peace that you can just give and not worry about what you're gonna get in return? He begins to explain to me how Jesus didn't just save his life, but Jesus was transforming his life. And in his being active in his church body and being active in God's word, he realized that his whole life must become about being like Jesus. He really embodied that to every single person, whether they deserved it or not. He taught me that if I wanted Jesus to transform my life, I had to give him my entire life, not just the pieces of me that I was okay giving the Lord. Before we get into the text today where Jesus calls the disciples over to observe the people's giving, I want to encourage you that your grandchildren and your children are watching you. They are watching how you speak, how you respond to your spouse in times of frustration or disagreement. They are watching how you speak to other people. If your life is in complete, a complete control of your hands, they notice. I promise I noticed another family member of mine who would say one thing about Jesus, but their life was controlled by them. If you have given your whole life over to Jesus and it overflows into all the areas of your life, I promise you, they notice. If you have your Bibles open, we're gonna start at Mark 12 and we're only gonna read a few verses today, verses 41 through 44. Jesus sat down near the collection box and I'm reading out the NLT. I just really like the language this morning, the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth. 
This poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions, for they give a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. Remember, Jesus had just been questioned four times, and and, um, they were supposed to um, examine the Passover lamb for four days. They had brought political and theological questions to him. They had tried everything to stump Jesus. You see these Pharisees, the Sanhedrins, the Jewish elites, you see these people view him as a rabbi and they were trying to stump him. He answered with such grace and ease. He brought Psalms 110 uh, into the passage when he asked, how could the Messiah be David's son and David's Lord? He has taught, he has argued, and he has debated. And now Jesus is sitting down. He sits across from the offering boxes. He calls his disciples over to watch people give. He is reminding them, they have seen the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin and the Jewish elite, but he turns their attention to this poor widow. He is showing them in this moment as the widow is giving how pure her worship is. In these temple courts across from the offering boxes, the boxes were actually in the outer court where uh, women and children worshiped, okay? And there was 13 trumpet shaped boxes. No idea what those looked like, but they said they were large at the top and they came to a point so that no one could steal from them. Gifts, offerings, and sacrifices were given in them. This was the most celebrated time of the year the most money would be given during this time period. When someone gave, you would hear a loud clanging sound. I am grateful that that's not how we do it today. Expose, it would would be exposed how much you have given in that moment. And the rich, they would be decked out, letting their offerings ring out so people could know. Everyone turned to the widow as he dropped her two coins And you know, they were thinking how insignificant her offering was. Yet Jesus said, watch her. And in this passage, y'all, we get to see the purest form of worship. Why? Because as poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. We're gonna look at three contrasts today that involve worship versus religion, sacrifice versus excess, and faith versus control. The first contrast today is worship versus religion. Let's say worship versus religion. Oh man, we can speak. Let's go. Okay. So the first part is breaking down the rich. Okay. They had extremely large offerings. Um, Some scholars suggested that they have a, they had a competitive spirit in their heart. Okay. I remember being young and in college and they were making me take all these tests And uh, the number one strength I had was competition, (laughs) okay? And so in everything in my life, even up until this day, I try to compete for everything. I am not even gracious with my five-year-old, my two-year-old, or my one-year-old. I will beat them and I will not feel shame about it, right? (laughs) I have to teach them that they don't get anything in this life. They have to earn it. Okay, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I need help. Okay, help me, God. There was a belief among the rich that they were God's gift to the world. Sometimes in the American church, we have people who believe that they are God's gift to the church just because they have an abundance and they can give greater than other people. They believe that they were carrying Judaism forward. That's where we see the spirit of religion. You have these people in this temple where women and children worshiped and they were decked to the nine. It makes me think about the only time I could go school shopping all year was tax-free weekend. My mom would take me to the outlets because not only was it tax-free weekend, we had to go get what was on sale, right? Okay. And so I was dressed to the nine for the first week of school. You know what I mean? That's what The religious people looked like they had their best outfits on. They wanted to show out. It was like the Met Gala, if you even know what the Met Gala is. And they believed that they themselves could carry this religion forward. They believed it all hinged on their shoulders. It's funny that Jesus says, my burden is light and my yoke is easy. 
But when you press forward with religion, it feels like the weight of the world is on your shoulders. My kids' salvation depends upon me, right? My business growing, it fully depends on me. My marriage succeeding, it fully depends on me. That's not true. When God is in the center of it, he does things that only he can do and we get to sit and watch, amen? They believe they were carrying Judaism forward. Then you get to this widow, you know that they were judging her for this gift. Do you know that she was the one who would be receiving the money that these rich people were giving? And she took all that she had and placed it for the poor. You know that she was getting judged for that because they were saying, your gift was insignificant. Your gift was gonna do nothing. Why wouldn't you just keep it so that you could eat for a few days? Why wouldn't you just keep it so you could find a place where you could lay your head? Why? Why? She was genuinely insignificant to the natural eye, but she believed in that moment that her worship is what mattered and it blessed God. Some of you are in here today and you believe that what you have is insignificant, but I'm here to tell you today that it blesses God when you give him your life. When you come in here struggling, defeated, not knowing what tomorrow will look like, and you throw your hands up and you say, worthy is the lamb. There is no one like the Lord. It blesses him. It blesses him. And the discipleship moment here is sometimes all you have is a couple of fish and loaves, but God still uses it and is blessed by your willingness don't wait for the wealthy people to give in the church. Take what you have and give it what he puts upon your heart. Because if he took two fishes and five loaves and fed 5,000 men plus women and children, he can take whatever you give and use it. Amen? Amen? It's not about what it looks like. And it's not about who celebrates you. It's about offering your heart in purity. It's about having a heart of gladness to bring an offering to the Lord, thanking him with joy, participating with pleasure. Is that how you live? Is that how you give? I'm down here worshiping and I'm just saying, God, thank you that I haven't thrown my life away. Thank you that you've snapped or, or you've, you've grabbed me from the depths of Sheol and you've placed my feet on solid ground and you've called me worthy because of what your son Jesus did for me. Thank you, God. Thank you that you still have a call on my life even when I want to throw it away to this day because just because I accept this call doesn't mean I wake up every day and I'm like, this is great. I can always make it. No, I can find myself saying, God, why would you choose me? God, why me? Just let me do something else. God says, just give me what you have and I will show you what I can do through you. Takeaway here is, is your whole life given to God? Will you give him every part of your life or are there still pieces that you don't want him to have? Brings us to our second contrast, number two. Sacrifice versus excess. Sacrifice versus excess. So you see the rich. You think, man, they just gave everything they had to. No, they calculated it. They gave what was comfortable to them, but with a little bit of competition in there. They said, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so is probably gonna bring this because of the profits from their business that year. So I'm gonna make sure I bring this so that when the clanging sounded, they would know that I'm the big baller in the room but yet that was still what was comfortable to them. They gave out of their abundance. And you know what's crazy? Abundance isn't even wrong. No one's condemning abundance. In Jesus' name, bless my household, right? In Jesus' name, bless my business. In Jesus' name, bless my finances. That's not what we're saying here. But they calculated everything because they knew, they knew, they knew, they knew that they had a lifestyle that they had to obtain. I think what's crazy is that they're not going to feel the hurt of this gift. In some sense, they're going through the motions. How many of you know we're in South Carolina, we're in the South, and in the South, you just go to church. You go to church, you worship, 
You listen to a message. Maybe just maybe your ears are open. Maybe they're not. You know what I mean? You got a lot going on in your head or whatever. And you're just going through the motions. This is where, this is where we really want to drive home in this excess is that their hearts aren't broken by the needs of the poor. Their hearts aren't driven by thankfulness to God for his goodness and mercy. I don't know if I've been thankful enough recently for his goodness and his mercy because he didn't have to bring me to this place. He didn't have to, in every mistake, bless me on the other side. Why? Because he's just that good. Because he's just that good. No matter in your turmoil, turmoil or despair, he can never be less good. His character never changes as much as ours does. His faithfulness never changes as much as ours does. And so I'm being convicted that I don't thank him enough for his goodness and his mercy. Am I just going through the motions? Am I just giving him just enough so that I can check off the religious box and say, I gave Lord, now use it. No, is my heart broken for the poor? There are poor people on this wealthy island. There are poor people in Bluffton that need the house of God to meet them in the midst of their situation. But do we just say, okay, somebody else will do it. I just, you know, I know so-and-so, they got deep pockets. They'll give when, you know, Pastor Brad comes up here and says, we got to do this. Am I just going through the motions? They have extra and will be honored if they go through the motions, so they do. There's a sense of honoring because of their big gifts. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now we're gonna be able to reach the poor. They don't reach the poor, they take it for themselves. That's what religious people do. They gain, 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 while preaching up here saying, it's for the poor, it's for the poor, it's for the poor. And they would be honored because they gave. They didn't care if it went to the poor. They just wanted people to affirm them because of our insecurities. How many times do we do that? We want people to affirm us exactly where we are because of our gift, right? Because we can do this and that and give this and give that. I need affirmation. No, he's already affirmed us. But it wasn't out of pure intention. You see the widow. The widow gives what cost her. Remember when David, he takes a census, which he hasn't, which he wasn't supposed to do, and God judges Israel for it. He's told to make an altar and to offer sacrifices to intercede and ask for mercy. The owner of the land, um, uh, Aaronah, tries to give David the land, the oxen, all he needs for the sacrifice, and David responds in 2 Samuel 24, 23 through 24. But the king said to Aaron, no, but I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord, my God, that cost me nothing. How often in the American church does our faith cost us nothing? Why? Because we know we're gonna have Chipotle or Cava on the way home. We know Monday our job's gonna be there. We know our AC's gonna kick on. And if not, we're gonna call a friend that has an HVAC company and they're gonna be there by five, right? We know that every little thing in this country is gonna be taken care of. So where's the cost on our life with serving Jesus? We may not be the widow, but we can learn from the widow that our life must cost something. The thing my grandpa showed me is that materials don't really matter that much, but serving the Lord faithfully and giving when people need it and giving to the church because he believed in his heart, that's what he was supposed to do. And he taught me that serving the Lord cost him his life, but he was grateful because he knew eternity was on the other side of that sacrifice. We have to have eyes of eternity we're not just doing this and getting to the end and hoping that the Bible was true. I've seen enough of God in my life to know that he is so real and all of his promises are yes and amen. All of them. But I think sometimes, and I'm speaking, you know, still in my 20s, but I say, I believe sometimes as we get older, we believe, I don't know if I have that much to offer. I don't know how much more I can give. You know, they'll just let the young bucks do it. 
I know a God that decided to use Abraham in his 80s. I know a God who decided to use Moses in his later years. If you've got breath in your lungs, you can still give God your entire life. If you've got breath in your lungs and the ability to move your feet every single morning, there are people watching you continue to give your life to Christ. This is not a place to mail it in. This is the place where you say, I'm gonna keep pressing on because I believe God can do revival through me. It doesn't just have to happen through a 21 year old. It can happen through me, why? Because he's still transforming me into wholeness and completeness with him. The widow understood that it was gonna cost her everything. David understood that I'm not gonna give a sacrifice to the Lord that costs me nothing. She gave all that she had to live on, which was her livelihood. There's a pain, there's a hurt, there's a lack that she's gonna know because of this. There's a lack in my wife and I are giving because it's what God has called us to do. But we are gonna teach our children in our home when God says, do we do? Sure, we can have moments where we question in the dark and say, God, are you really gonna come through? But he does each and every time on his own time. And we're grateful for it. And the discipleship moments here is that real worship involves sacrifice. Real worship involves sacrifice. All of our lives belong to God. And that means financial generosity. Don't be a Christian that believes God is in everything but finances because you've seen this church do this and this church do this and this pastor fail here and this pastor fail here. Well, so-and-so didn't ever spend the money I wanted him to. If God told you to give, give. And he will convict the hearts of the leaders if they're spending money in ways they don't need to. You don't have to be the spiritual police. Just do when God says do. Don't sit back and wait for somebody else to do it on your same row. When God speaks, obey. Why? Because your faith is on the line and other people are watching you. I don't want to get to heaven and him not say, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's what I'm living for. That's what I'm striving for. I don't want him to say each and every time I told you to obey in the area of finances, you stopped. Why? Because you were hurt by this pastor. You were hurt by this church. Push past it because it hurt Jesus when he hung on the cross and he took every spot and every sin from us so that we could become the spotless lamb and become in righteousness with God. Pastor Caleb, he shared this article with me because I can't say I read an article. I don't, that's not true. He shared this article with me. Can't preach this passionately and be like, I read an article. Well, that's a lie. He showed me this article that says uh, on tithing that American Christians spend more on Starbucks lottery tickets and dog food than they give to their local church. Y'all, I love dogs, but not that much. I'm not gonna spend more on dog food than what God asked me to give. I believe tithing is a biblical principle. Tithing is a clear command in the Old Testament for Israel. They were to bring 10% as a base gift, a consistent gift. The New Testament doesn't as firmly communicate that this principle continues on in the new covenant. So some teach that the 10% position should not be clung to as if it's exactly applicable. Church history has wavered between the two positions. There is, there are seasons where the church has taught, bring your 10%, bring your first fruits. And there are other times where they have taught the words of Paul that each should determine in their heart what to give. But there has never been a Christian position that teaches that Christians should not give or they should give only what they are prosperous or the bare minimum. I do believe in tithing today for 10% that provides for the community of God and the church's mission. I think it's the starting place of giving that we should all participate in. If you're struggling with the concept of financial generosity in your life, just obey God and let him show up in your life the way he desires to, because he's formed you in your mother's womb and he has had a plan for you since before you were born. So obey Stop getting hung up on, do we believe in 10% or do we believe in giving what's on your heart? Just give what you feel convicted to give about. 
Because these are our pastor's words. The New Testament doesn't as firmly communicate that this principle continues on in the new covenant. So some teach that the 10% position should not be clung to as if it's exactly applicable. But Paul taught that each should determine in his heart what to give. But as for me and my household, we tithe because I've seen the fruits of tithing 10%. I give God my first fruits and I live on 90. Why? To remind myself that it's not mine in the first place. And we've had seasons where he's asked us to go above 10%. And my Lord, have we seen blessing on the other side. But we didn't give so that we could be blessed. We gave out of obedience because it is what God has said. And if God is our ruler, right? Not just savior. So many people, Jesus is your savior. But when he's your Lord, you obey. You don't get hung up on, well, this principle and this principle. When you're in an argumentative state, you're showing the posture of your heart. The American church, we argue because we are not transformed in the presence of the Lord. We don't have these moments of revival that break us, that mold us, that transform us. We come and we sit down and we say, I wish a pastor would talk about this. If you have more to say about the church and less to say about what's happening on the inside of you, there's your posture of your heart. If you were having more going on in your life, in your personal time with the Lord, you wouldn't have so much to speak about, about the church, about the pastor, about this, about that. When he calls us to obey, we have to. We have to obey. In 2 Corinthians 8, verses one through two, it says, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. We're not all overflowing with a wealth of generosity. I know when God calls us to give, it's gonna hurt. I know when God calls us to give, we might not be in a time where we believe we can give. But just remember, the whole point of this passage is not to convict you about what you gave in the, in the offering basket or online. This is about, is your whole life submitted to God? Are you a disciple of Jesus or not? Because those in the temple were in all of Jesus, but then they were gonna say, crucify you later. You can be in all of Pastor Caleb's deep anointed preaching, but you would probably still say crucify him the moment he doesn't meet your need. Because American Christianity is about what can God give me? I'm gonna do this so that you can bless me. I'm gonna do this, so you can give this to me. No, I'm gonna lay my life down for you. And if you don't give me another thing, you already sent your son down to die for me in the first place. So that's good enough. And everything else from there is something I didn't deserve in the first place. It's something to say about the church of Macedonia that in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. When your soul is at a desolate place, you have to get in the presence of God and say, let me overflow with joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Not in what I can earn this year, not in what I can lift this year, right? Not in any of those things, not all the goals I can hit, I'm probably the most goal-oriented person. But it's not about that. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And even if I'm in a severe test of affliction, I can still have an abundance of joy. And I can give when he says give, knowing that he will use two fishes and five loaves on the other side. Does your worship cost you anything? Or is it out of the excess you have because it is what the church asks of you? Or do you worship out of a place of sacrifice because he first sacrificed everything for you in the first place? When was the last time you were even reminded of the sheer sacrifice that Jesus did in the first place? If the cross isn't the beginning, Jesus will never be our everything. Contrast number three, faith versus control. 
The rich, they wanted to control their lifestyle. There was no significance to their gift. Can you think about that? The richest people that were in the temple, their gifts were insignificant because they were so calculated. They said, God, as long as you can move in this, I'm okay. How many of us, I can tell you that I live my life like that. God, as long as you can move in this, because if you ask me to move out here, people are gonna call me crazy. So move right here. They wanted to be seen and not depend on God, but depend on themselves. When we chase the American dream, we have to have a dependency on ourselves because choosing to lay our life down for God is gonna sound weird in a business meeting. It's gonna sound weird when we're on the golf course and -and so-and-so is breaking this record and God told you to give this. And so you're like, I'm not gonna be anywhere near. And then in five years you meet him and God has done more in you out of your generosity and obedience than what he's done for somebody who said, everything I can do, I'm gonna do with my hands. I'm gonna prove to so-and-so. Us men, we have an innate desire to please our earthly father, whether we say it or not. We want someone to be proud of us at some point in our life. And can I tell you that the brother in the prodigal son story is the one who got it wrong. He was in the fields and says, Father, haven't you seen what I've done for you this whole time? And he said, what are you talking about? Everything I have is yours. We look for affirmation when he's already given it to us in the first place. We have to depend on God. And you see the widow. She's got enough manna for today. And she trusts that God will provide for tomorrow. She knew that tomorrow's daily bread was coming. She was putting herself in a position to rely on God. She's dependent. I'm telling you, can't tell you how many times I'm not dependent on the Lord. Sure, when I'm here on Sunday and I'm, and I'm aware of it, I depend. But then the moment I get back into my routine where the Lord isn't etched into everything, I leave him out. I have been convicted of wanting to do all of this stuff for the Lord so that he can see me, so that he can be proud of me. And he spoke to me one time and he says, I only want to do all of it with you. Sure, I will remind you at times how proud of you I am, but I want to be in every single moment of your life. Don't invite him out on your worst days and invite him in when you have a rush of the spirit. Keep him in in your darkest moments because that's where hope begins to take place where you didn't think it could be in the first place. There has to be a dependency upon God in everything that if he calls you to give up everything, you will. Can you even just say that? That's hard. I don't know if in every moment I can say that. That's hard. I like what I have. I like the thought of prospering even more in the future. But if God called me at any moment to give everything up, can I? It's a hard thing to think about. As the band makes their way up, through sacrificial giving, we lean into God's provision for our life. Sometimes I can do things without thinking. I can just throw some instructions away and believe I'm smart enough to figure it out. And then I realize a Swedish person made it and there's 700 things for a basic dresser and I've broken the dresser before I even was able to use it because I thought that I have it all. I have it under control. Sometimes I use speed as my kryptonite. I can just figure it out. I'll just go. I can get this. I got it. Everybody get out of my way. I'll figure it out. But God has a plan of provision for our life. But if we do not lean into a sacrifice, then we will never see his provision for our life. We will only see what our hands can produce. And can I tell you that our hands can produce really good things? but they're not God things. And God thinks on the other side of good things is better than you could ever ask, think, or imagine. 
That Ephesians 3.20 quote is on the back of good things that my hands can produce. Yeah, but God can do better than we could ask, think, or imagine. But when was the last time we lived in a posture of sacrifice? God, when you ask me, I will. God, if you've asked me before and I've ignored it, bring it back to my remembrance. So often we're searching for the next word. And when was the last time we asked God for the last word that we ignored? He probably asked you to sacrifice back here, but he's not mad at you because you kept going forward. He's just jealous for you. He's jealous for you in everything and he wants you to invite him in. And when he speaks, you do so that you can see his provision for your life. We don't have to wait to have heaven on earth. We can have heaven on earth in our life every single day. And everywhere we go, the spirit of God follows and people are transformed. Why? Just because we've lived a life of sacrifice that says on this earth, I will live for Jesus and Jesus alone. He can have it all. Take my life, just give me Jesus. Some don't give because they don't trust that God will provide tomorrow. As we learn to be people who give, we grow in expectation and experience God's provision. We learn who he is. On the back end of sacrifice, there is a learning of who he is. There is more to God than you understand. You haven't learned all about God. There is more for you. You will learn about who he is as a father and a provider. We give when things are tight. Don't let my circumstance be a reason that you're not giving. We give when we're prospering and we give when we're struggling. And as I end today, I wanna leave you with a couple thoughts. The first one is Romans 12, two. I appeal to you therefore brothers by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. It is spiritual worship for you to present your body as a living sacrifice. I promise you that just lifting your hands on Sunday because the worship here is really good. It's not a living sacrifice. And this is not a message of condemnation. This is a message of let's correct and let's move forward because there's still more that we could do in our own life and sacrifice because there is spiritual worship that we have yet to even fully tap into. The earliest Christians believed that for the saint does not belong to this world, that the whole life of the Christian belonged to God and his service, that we were to live with eternity in mind, always looking to give rather than receive. If you would just stand up and close your eyes. I want you to think about these last two thoughts and then the prayer team can come down, the altar team. We're gonna give you a moment to respond and in just a minute. Just close your eyes and ponder on this for a second. The modern Christian gives more to Starbucks than the promotion of the gospel. We've lost joy, pleasure, thanksgiving, gladness, and a focus on eternity altogether. I believe we can be the church that says yes to a revival in Hilton Head, Bluffton, and wherever else God puts on the heart of our pastor and our elder board. But if revival doesn't happen in our life first, it will never happen in the church because the church is people. And if it's not happening in people, it won't happen in a room. I believe we can be a church where there are people that are living sacrifices that are every day saying, God, I give you my all. I will carry my cross today. Whatever you say, I will do. Wherever you say go, I will go. I will not be a person that spends more on coffee than the promotion of the gospel. I will not be a person that spends more on the lifestyle that I want to live than on the gospel because the gospel is the hope of the world. And there are lost people right here. You have lost neighbors, you have lost friends. And because there is not a revival taking place on your heart, you do not burn for people who will go to hell when they die. 
The gospel goes forward with money and with people who are on fire for Jesus. It's not just people who are on fire with Jesus. It takes money for the gospel to move forward. We've lost joy, pleasure, thanksgiving, gladness, and a focus on eternity altogether. As your eyes are closed, there was you know, an awesome word given back in our time of prayer with the worship team and the altar team. And this person said, I just feel like people feel like they're failing. Like they keep trying to run their race and then they fail, so they walk away. And then they hear a good sermon or a good worship moment and they walk back and they say, wait, I like living for Jesus. And then they fail again, so they walk away. And I want to remind you that therefore there is now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. If it is in you, sure, you will always feel like a failure, but our Father's character is not to call you a failure. He will call you a son or a daughter, and He will remind you that you are not a failure, but you are a faith-filled believer who can press on even when you fail. You do not have to run away and keep coming back. Don't do that. Just stay in the presence of God and let Him change